With me I have Professor Uzi Wabi, the director of the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Tel Aviv University. Professor, thank you very much for joining us here on RT. My pleasure. The Israeli Defense Minister Ehud Barak recently said that Israel would not be duped over negotiations regarding Iran's nuclear program. Do you think that sanctions have been effective? Yeah, I think that uh, since the implementation of the SWIFT sanctions a couple of months ago, I think there, there is a progress. So I think that what uh, the message is pretty clear. In 2012, we are having a different ball game, and Iran is on, uh, realizing that if it is not going to comply, it would be very pricey for Iran. If Iran is beginning to feel the pinch, why are we still hearing war rhetoric from the Israeli leadership? I think that what the Israeli leadership is doing is just to uh, capitalize on kind of a momentum with the uh, sanctions. First of all, in the mind of many Israelis, especially those leaders you are talking about, the implementation of sanctions is kind of a byproduct of an Israeli pressure. So, because Israel actually threatened to militarily attack Iran. This was uh, or forced the European Union and the Americans, especially the Americans, to come up with a much more, let us say, strict policy with regard to Iran in order to appease Israel. This is how Israel takes things. Now, since Obama and the American administration would not like the idea of having kind of an imbroglio in the Middle East before November, I think that what Obama did with the uh, SWIFT sanctions is on the one hand to tell Israel we are on board and you should just set aside now actually and we are going to dictate the rhythm with regard to Iran. On the other hand there was a message which we, uh, was sent to Iran that it's going to be very pricey. So basically it could cut either ways but I think that where we stand now is kind of a, a stalemate, but the last just one more, more note, I think that what the Iranians are doing, and this is uh, very, very typical of their diplomacy, they are trying to drive a wedge between the Israelis and the Americans, between the Is Americans and the Europeans, by coming up with those uh, notions as to say, yes, we would like to actually listen carefully to what you offer. We have offers on our side. Is that enough to satisfy the Israeli leadership? Or could we still see Israel attacking Iran? I think it is unlikely. I, uh, first of all, I'm pretty sure that until November nothing will happen in that regard. And even after November, we are going to have the same problem. There are many, uh, let us say, uh, figures or public figures like the former head of the Mossad and others who are coming up with kind of a counter argument the final analysis of which, or the bottom line of which, is at, it, at least at this time, this is not the thing Israel should come up with. Don't talk actually about military solution. How deep is this differences of opinion between the Israeli political leadership and security establishment? No, I think they are representative enough. And one should take into consideration that these are the guys who are going to take the decision not the people who used to serve in the Mossad or the army or whatever. But at the same time, I would say that there are many questions that are still open. What's the volume of such an attack? How well prepared the Israeli public for the ramifications if and when? What would be the political, geopolitical ramifications of such an attack? And another question, can Israel go it alone? My assessment is that Israel should not do that by itself, if at all. And my assessment is that Israel has done uh, uh, some, or came up with some moves that I think uh, persuaded the West, mainly the United States, to be much more firm when it comes to Iran. And I think that we'll have to wait and see because, in my opinion, sanctions do work. Why are sanctions working? People are going to suffer. And people who are going to suffer are middle class citizens. When it comes to the middle class, this is the ingredient where revolutions start, or this is the point where revolutions start. I think that the Iranian leadership realizes that. What they are going to do, we'll, uh, we'll have to wait and see. 
but I will not be surprised if I would find kind of an inner discussion or even dissensions within the Iranian political circles about how to proceed from now on. What about an Iranian retaliation? How effective would it be? Not that effective uh, as to uh, destroy Israel or something in the sort, of course. But uh, the Iranians could just uh, use their proxies in the region, mainly Hezbollah, uh, using their rockets. So what they will have in mind, and this would be the retaliation policy of the Iranians, is to install kind of, um, I would say, seats of instability wherever you can. When it comes to no man's lands in Yemen, in Iraq, even in uh, North Africa, using Hezbollah, and hitting American bases in the Gulf. If the scenario unfolded that Israel attacked Iran, there are nations that would help Iran acquire a nuclear weapon. Is that a realistic scenario? Yeah, I mean, in a way, that could be kind of a scenario that we'll, we're going to have or see there. Uh, but I would say that the problem with a nuclear Iran is not that Iran is going to destroy Israel. I do not believe in that it would be kind of a source of inspiration in nuclear Iran for many radical groups in the region to start actually act in a different manner now when they have kind of a nuclear backup. This is the thing. So I'm not sure that the game is, I mean, no, the main issue is in the question as you put it. I think that what we have here is kind of a psychological game. Moving across to Syria, Israel has been surprisingly quiet and inactive in terms of developments there. Is it because time is on Israel's side or because it does not want to see a regime change there? Well, I think that Israel is pretty confused about that. This is kind of a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-linguistic state. A state which is comprised of many different uh, religious and uh, ethnic types. And this is a state that could easily become what we call failed state, which means a state that cannot control over all the territory. And more often than not, you have some flanks or regions that are becoming kind of a no man's land. We have had that in Libya already after the toppling down of Gaddafi. We do see that in Sinai. Al-Qaeda and other radical groups are capitalizing on that kind of a situation. And whenever you have a weak central state, and this is exactly kind of a byproduct of the toppling the dictator, we're going to have a bunch of power centers. Syria seems to be more concerned with Turkey than with Israel. How can Syria be so sure that Israel won't take advantage of its weakening? I don't think that Israel would take an advantage because um, in that sense, because, you know, what Israel had had when it, uh, I mean, throughout the 20th century, I mean, the, the closing decades of the 20th century is a quite uh, silent Golan Heights or border with Syria. Um, I think that Israel is a spectator. Israel cannot influence or do something with that ever-changing region now on top of the Arab Spring. As I said before, I think Israel is confused. And Israel has to just come up with kind of a strategy or at least a set of tactics of how to deal with the, this new situation. Basically, it is becoming much more difficult Middle East for Israel because Egypt and Turkey, one time friendly and staunch supporter, supporters of Israel in the West, in the region, are not there anymore. Isn't it time Israel makes a decision in terms of what's happening in Syria? Yeah, I think that it is high time, but I'm not sure that it has to do with kind of a modus operandi by which Israel should do something in Syria. Of course not. Uh, Israel should actually set uh, clear what the, uh, uh, its set of preferences is. Uh, but I think that Israel should be much more elastic and more responsive. Because what we're going to have in Syria, I think, in 2012, maybe 2013, is a real change. The Syrian uprising has shifted towards suicide bombing. If that is a sign of greatest terrorist involvement in the uprising, aren't Syria and Israel then fighting the same enemy? In a way, yes, and this is what I meant uh, before. But, you know, I can't find now kind of a common denominator between Bashar and Israel. What you say about those terrorists means that one should start thinking of Bashar not controlling all over Syria. 
or having at least some lacunas or latifundias which are beyond the scope of his control. This is actually uh, something by which to better understand that he, um, his situation in Syria is deteriorating and in the long run he won't be able to just stand, stay on. What are the implications of the Arab Spring for Israel? I think that Israel uh, uh, got kind of a much more difficult Middle East, at least geostrategically or geopolitically speaking. Egypt is not there anymore to form as kind of a pro-Western staunch supporter of a more stable Middle East. And I think, and this is why I think Israel should find out kind of a replacement, so to speak. Turkey is also changing its tone in the recent years. And Israel will find the Middle East as kind of, um, I would say, space or an area where you can't think of kind of a regional or comprehensive peace as was the case before, but to just strive for having what I would call interim or partial agreements. I think that we are getting back to 1949 or 1950s when nobody talked about peace, but we do talk about agreements. Professor Ozirabi, thank you very much for joining us here on RT. Thank you.